Hi, and welcome to the lecture for Module 7. Today we'll be talking about the painter Raphael. Some of the key points that we'll be discussing today include Raphael's ability to incorporate and assimilate other artistic styles. He very much adapts the work of others who are working at the same time as him, as his contemporaries. He's also very well known for a very harmonious balance of color and design. So by focusing on design and drawing, he's coming very much from the Florentine tradition, but he finds an ability to use these beautiful colors that he becomes very well known for, and that's something that his contemporaries such as Leonardo and Michelangelo aren't really praised for. And finally, one of the other major points we'll discuss is the importance of the workshop. And I've talked about this a little bit with some of the other artists, how almost never was an artist working completely on his or her own. Instead, they were actually the manager of a much larger workforce where they were in charge, and it was all about being able to manage the hands of several different other painters. Raphael becomes very skilled at this, and he's very well known for his managerial techniques. As you learn from your reading from Vasari, Raphael trains very early on in his life with the artist named Perugino. Now, we didn't talk about Perugino before, but he's working around the same time as, an, as artists like Botticelli. He's even painting in the same context as Botticelli, for example, in the Sistine Chapel for Sixtus IV, so in the 1480s. He's very well known at that time. He's really a master of the earlier Renaissance. It's hard to say, it's, it's not exactly right to call Perugino Raphael's teacher, but instead he worked in his studio and in his workshop after he'd already received some training. So Raphael moves from his hometown of Urbino to Perugia, where Perugino's workshop is. Perugino's style at that time was a bit outmoded. And so Raphael's style is a little bit outmoded at the beginning of his career, basically until he's exposed to Leonardo's style when he eventually goes to Florence. So I wanted to start by showing you a work by Perugino in his work so you can see the strong interest in linear perspective. What we're seeing here is the marriage of the Virgin. So on the right side of this priest, you see the Virgin Mary. Standing opposite her is Joseph, and they are in the moment of this wedding ceremony where they're exchanging rings. They're surrounded by attendants on either side, very nicely balanced in numbers, but also by the use of color. You've got these two figures whose backs are turned towards you, so this nice symmetry, which you can also see in this ideal city type. So in the background, this circular structure could be read as a sort of temple, and this is in a long tradition of ice, ideal city plans that show up in painting. It's something that Perugino explored in the Sistine Chapel as well. Around the same time, Raphael produces his own marriage of the Virgin, and often this is referred to as the sposalizio, which is the Italian form of that idea of the marriage of the Virgin. So you can see a lot of similarities between their two paintings. The compositions are very similar in a very basic sense of the word. If you look at the attendants around Mary, their facial type is very, very similar to that of Perugino. And Perugino's works very commonly have this facial type, so it's, his works are very easy to identify for that reason. But I think you can see that Raphael's has a bit more dynamism. The figures in Perugino's are standing in this nice contrapposto. You've got the same figure uh, on Joseph's side, breaking the stick, but Raphael's emerges into space a bit more and is a bit more dynamic. The priest isn't this perfectly centered, static figure. Instead, he interacts more with the figures. And then the perspective system, our vantage point is a little bit higher up than in Perugino, so we can see more of the pavement, and we can see Raphael's ability to create three-dimensional space by using linear perspective. Again, we have a temple in the background. You can see the same sort of openings that Perugino included in this ideal temple plan. But Raphael's is actually a bit more classicizing. The portico around this is using classical columns, and it just has a more overall classical feel rather than an adaptation, a Renaissance version of classicism. And I just wanted to compare more directly the facial types that we see in Perugino's work on the left side here, as we see in Raphael's work on the right. So especially in the female faces, you have this sort of sweetness, this very small facial features that come to characterize the early work of Raphael because he's so good at mimicking Perugino's style. And this was a very important ability to have if you are working in another artist's workshop. So 
we can often identify several different hands, but you want an overall harmonious view of the overall work of art. Early on in his career, especially before 1508, Raphael does a huge number of private commissions. Many of these are done while he's in Florence. He does work in a few other areas, but most of his patrons are in Florence. A, a very large number of these private commissions are small virgin and child images. So hopefully this makes you think back to the works of Leonardo specifically. Remember when he's experimenting with the composition of the Virgin and Child and St. Anne in so many ways. We don't have St. Anne here. We do have our John the Baptist over here on the left side, identifiable by his little garment and the reed cross that he's carrying. But like Leonardo, we see an interest with, with Raphael in pyramidal compositions. But unlike Leonardo, you see an interest in brighter colors and very softly modeled forms. So there's no sfumato like we're used to seeing with Leonardo. I wouldn't say that there's a harsh outline necessarily to the shapes of the figures. They sort of blend into the other colors a bit more seamlessly, but without that obscuring effect of sfumato. Raphael's Madonnas are characterized by this sweetness that exists in the gestures and the gazes between the figures. They often also have this very nice landscape setting, and I would characterize this background as being very much like Leonardo da Vinci's work. But it's a bit less hazy and mysterious than you see in something like the Mona Lisa, for example. So Raphael's work can be characterized as harmonious, delicate, and lovely, and this can really be used to describe many of his virgin and child works. This one is generally referred to as the Madonna of the Meadow. They each get their own little name usually about the patron or about some special feature of the background because otherwise calling all of them Madonna and Child with St. John would get a little redundant. Here's another example from slightly later. This one is referred to as the small Cooper Madonna named for one of the owners. Here you've got a slightly different composition rather than having that third focal point with the young John the Baptist. Instead we just have this intimate interaction between the Virgin and her son. So we've got the nude baby Christ who's grabbing onto his mother's neck and stepping on her hand with his other foot. And we see her looking a bit melancholic into the distance. But you can see that same harmonious color palette, this interest in a reseeding landscape using atmospheric perspective. Here he set them up in front of a wall rather than having them really continue into the background here. But again, you see this interest in creating a devotional image, so something that somebody could own in their private home that would move them to piety to see this woman chosen by God to bear his son. And you see those very slight indication of a halo on both figures, but otherwise that almost looks like a portrait. While in Florence, Raphael does execute a few portraits, and I'm going to just show you these two examples here. In the Renaissance, and especially into the 16th century, you see a rise in portraiture specifically of a commemoration of the individual. What we're seeing here is an example of wedding portraits. So two portraits commissioned by the bride and the groom to celebrate their marriage. So on the right side, we're seeing the husband here, Agnolo Doni. This is the same patron as Michelangelo's Doni Tondo. On the left side, we're seeing his new wife, Madalena Strozzi Doni. And I hope that the first thing you notice about her portrait is how much the composition looks like the Mona Lisa. This portrait, among some others, is one way that is used to date Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. Because remember I talked about in that module how different his conception of portraiture was with the Mona Lisa. It actually came to shape all later portraits. So we see Raphael using that same pyramidal composition, the three the three quarter turn, the arms resting on a, an arm, on the arm of a chair, hands folded across her lap, and then a nice landscape in the background, although there's much more emphasis on the figure here than the receding landscape. Madalena is also lavishly adorned, unlike the Mona Lisa, which is displaying the wealth of her family and her dowry. That's often what these marriage portraits were for. Again, we don't see any sfumato technique, so even though he's absolutely impacted by the work of Leonardo, his pictorial style is quite different. Raphael is very big on linearity and this idea of disegno, this Florentine, the central Italian custom 
of focusing on drawing, on looking at the human form, rather than using color to build up an image, which is something we're going to talk about when we talk about Venetian artists. You notice that a few strands of her hair escape to give her a sense of naturalism, that she's not just this perfect figure. Both figures have a very strong outward gaze, which enhances the formality of the image. So you have a nice balance between naturalism and formality. Like his wife, Agnolo rests his arm on something, but here it's more of a parapet. You can see this balustrade here rather than a chair. It adds to the illusionism and it also makes him seem even more approachable. He is also shown remarkably dressed. His stare, though, is a little bit more hostile, it seems. This follows certain traditions in the depiction of the couple. It was much easier, actually, in portraiture to manipulate male decor on what was an appropriate way to represent an individual. But we do see Raphael depending on older models quite a bit, even though he's also looking forward with the work of Leonardo as an inspiration. In many ways, Raphael's paintings are also very classicizing, and I wanted to show you one example of that, his classicizing altarpiece, and this one is referred to as the Madonna del Baldacchino, the Madonna of the Baldacchino, and that is this fabric canopy that hangs over her. So we see another one of his virgin and child images, but here she is enthroned. She's surrounded by quite a few different saints. We see Peter here on the left side. He's always identifiable by his keys. It's interesting that the saints surrounding the scene interact with each other pretty readily, as well as with us, the viewer. This figure is looking out to us, making sure we see exactly what we're supposed to be looking at here. He gestures towards the Virgin and Child as the focal point of this image. You have these little cherub figures down here at the bottom reading the scroll. And then at the top, you have two really different sorts of angels flying in. The one here on the left is just so dramatic in its illusionism, the way you can really get a sense of the leg underneath that drapery. And then the architectural setting, as well as the throne itself, both are referring to classical models. This kind of work is referred to as a Sacra Conversazione, which we've talked about before, this depiction of the Virgin and Child surrounded by saints who could not have gathered all in one place. In this image, and with some of Raphael's other altarpieces, we see little sign of the contemporary fascination with action and movement. And this work is more closely related to that of Perugino. It's just these angels that really seem to start deviating from that. We seem to pull this curtain back so that we can experience the vision of the Madonna and child here. I'm now showing you a work entitled The Entombment, dating to 1507. We actually know the date of it because Raphael signs it. You can see the signature picked out in gold right down here, and he includes the date of this as well. This was an altarpiece. It's now in a museum, but originally was commissioned to hang on an altar in the city of Perugia. Remember, this is where he trains with Perugino. And it's done for a female patron named Atalanta Baglioni, and it was commissioned as a votive offering in memory of her son, Grifonetto, who was killed in a piazza in Perugia in the course of a family feud. Now, Perugia is known for its quite violent history. They're often at war. And this work in particular is among the first that shows Michelangelo's importance to Raphael's pictorial style. Raphael here has detached himself both formally and iconographically from traditional representations of the scene. He's not really depicting the entombment itself, but instead the focus is on the carrying of the dead Christ. The protagonists of the scene do not demonstrate their sorrow violently, like we saw with Giotto's work, for example, but are instead reduced through this Raphaelesque mode of feeling and sort of a psychological intensity to a sort of painful resignation. It's a very interesting work for a lot of different reasons, one of which is that it's actually showing that it's actually a combination of three different typical scenes after Christ's Passion. So Raphael gives us clues as to the narrative sequence of events. So combining what's referred to as a deposition or the removal of the body on the cross, you can see the three crosses in the background here, so you can sense that these figures have all moved through space down that rocky cliff over to here. Now this is a lamentation over the body. The centerpiece here is Christ's 
idealized naturalistic form which the figures are in the process of carrying and the next stage of movement is this actual entombment itself so you see the figures over here starting to climb the small set of stairs to go into this cave-like setting which would have been the tomb so you have quite a few figures included here so Christ absolutely is the focal point even though he's not at the very center at the back here you've got several different figures including Joseph of Arimathea who is probably this figure here without the halo Joseph of Arimathea was said to have been the one who gave Christ his own tomb to be buried in. In the red and blue in the background with the halo is John the Evangelist, said to be present at the crucifixion. In gold and green is likely supposed to be Nicodemus, who was also present at the crucifixion. In the center here with blonde hair is Mary Magdalene, and she reaches towards the face of Christ and also holds his hand. But notice she actually doesn't come into contact with his body. Actually, none of them do. They all have something between their own hand and his body. It's too holy for them to touch themselves. You can see the grief on the face of several of these figures. And then finally, the grouping of the figures on the right side, you have the Virgin Mary standing here completely swooning, collapsing into the arms of the other Marys who were said to be present at the crucifixion. Now notice this figure seated here on the ground. This should look very familiar to you and, and should remind you of Michelangelo's Donitondo, which had been executed just a couple of years before. And remember, Raphael is working also for Agnolo Doni, so it's very likely that he saw Michelangelo's work in that collection. Now there's one other figure I haven't identified yet, and that is the central youth in the red and green drapery here. Notice he doesn't have a halo. And notice I've also identified all of the traditionally depicted figures within a scene of the entombment. Art historians have assumed that it's probably supposed to be a portrait of Grifonetto Baglioni, the son of the woman who commissioned this work who had just recently died. We don't have any evidence for that, but he's given such prominence here that it is almost certainly supposed to be his portrait. This work was revered almost as soon as it was displayed. Vasari raves over it, calling it one of the most famous paintings in the land. And it's so popular that actually in 1608, the Cardinal Scipione Borghese, who was the nephew of the Pope, had this work stolen so that he could have it in his private collection. So that's where it is found today, actually. The figural types here are much more sculptural and very physical and have a lot of three-dimensionality in a way that his earlier figures don't. So in that regard and also in the color system as well, again, as the sighted figure from the Donitondo, we really see the impact of Michelangelo's works on Raphael. Raphael's career dramatically improves under the patronage of Pope Julius II. So we've talked about Julius II before, especially in relationship to Bramante and Michelangelo, this major patron of the arts. And here we're seeing a portrait that Raphael painted of the Pope. Here he looks like this sad old man, but remember this is the guy who rode into horseback at about this same age. So we don't know. We don't really know the exact circumstances of how Raphael comes to the attention of Julius II. It's very likely because of Bramante. We know that Bramante and Raphael were distantly related, so it's likely that he made him introductions at the court. So Raphael begins working in the Vatican at the same time that Michelangelo is painting the Sistine ceiling. This creates a great sense of rivalry. Some stories say that when Michelangelo took a break while creating the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, the Bramante urged Julius to have Raphael finish the chapel. Although Michelangelo refused visitors to the Sistine Chapel, it is likely that Raphael saw it at some point because some of his works produced at the same time in the Vatican, not very far away from the Sistine Chapel, really show the significant influence of Michelangelo's works. So I'm going to start by talking about this room called the Stanza della Segnatura which is in the papal apartments of the Vatican. Raphael is commissioned by Julius II to paint his private apartments, and this is a very direct rejection of the Pope's predecessor, Alexander VI, because he had just had a new series of apartments built and decorated by Pinturicchio, who Vasari mentions in the life of Raphael as well. 
Also, Raphael was nearly a nobody at this point. He wasn't really well known, so it's kind of surprising that he was selected for this. He's very young at this point, and there were lots of artists working in Rome who were probably more equipped and familiar with the subject matter. So the first commission happens in this room, the Stanza della Signatura. During the reign of Julius II, this was his private library. Later, eventually, it becomes, it becomes a room to sign documents, hence the name Stanza della Signatura, the room of the signature. And on the four walls, we see Raphael painting very large frescoes that show the four main bodies of human knowledge, that is philosophy, religion, poetry, and law. He also frescoed the ceiling, which you can see here, and I'll show you some details of later. And the ceiling shows allegories of these themes and narratives that show the commingling of the adjacent scenes. There are no separate figures here. And I'll spend the most time talking about the painting that we see on this wall right here, which is called the School of Athens, which in many ways is considered the paradigm of high Renaissance art in a classical sense. So here's a better view of this work, the School of Athens. We see Raphael exploiting the space of the room. So you see the doorway that's obviously built into the space. He uses this arched opening to create an illusionistic space. So it looks like this is extending the space of the room. And that shape is also continued in this barrel vault that we see in the background. The perspectival system here is one point linear perspective, and we have the vanishing point happening right between the heads of these two central figures. Right in the middle, you've got the two figures of Plato and Aristotle next to him. They're shown debating the origin of knowledge. Plato says that knowledge comes from the heavens, that you're born with it, which is why he gestures upwards, whereas Aristotle holds his hand out, gesturing towards the ground, saying that knowledge is empirical, that it comes from your experience on earth. Plato and Aristotle are shown surrounded by this huge cast of philosophers and mathematicians. So this is in some ways sort of like a secular sacra conversazione. This is a grouping of figures that have, could have never been in the same room at the same time. He includes such figures as Euclid, Zoroaster, and Ptolemy. And many of these figures have been given portraits of his contemporaries. I'll go into that in, in a little more detail in just a minute. The setting that he is using here, the architectural setting, seems to be based on designs for New St. Peter's. And it very much looks like Bermonte's project. You can imagine that there would be a dome rising between these two barrel vaults. And this was about the extent of the architecture during the work of Bermonte during Bermonte's lifetime. So basically, the new basilica is shown holding all of the universes thought up by these philosophers and mathematicians. Some art historians also say that it looks quite a bit like an ancient Roman bath complex. So it's Raphael showing his familiarity with both with ancient architecture and with the work of Bramante. So I want to talk just a little bit more about the, image, about the portraits that he includes. So this is another way that he makes the painting very current. So setting it in New St. Peter's makes it very contemporary but so does this inclusion of portraits. So in the center, depicted as Plato, is a portrait of Leonardo da Vinci. Over to the right side, this figure who is bent over and drawing with a compass is a portrait of Bramante. Over on the right side, the figure with a black cap who's looking out towards us is considered to be a self-portrait of Raphael. Interestingly enough, in the cartoon that survives for this work, Raphael actually didn't include a figure right here, and instead the figure of Aristotle has a very different face, so it's been speculated that perhaps Raphael originally wanted to include himself as Aristotle, but then thought better of it. And then finally, the last major portrait included here is this seated figure here, and this is said to be a portrait of Michelangelo. So the Stanza della Signatura is very, very close to the Sistine Chapel. And it's harder to see in this image, but if you go and see the School of Athens, you can see that this, this figure with the portrait of Michelangelo is painted in a really different style. It's much more sculptural. It's this hulking, heavy figure. The skin tone is darker, and it's dressed very much like what Michelangelo has been described as. This figure is also not included in the original cartoon, so it seems that Raphael is sort of wanting us to think that Michelangelo came in one day, saw all of these portraits, 
and painted this figure himself. Now there's no way that actually happened. It's surely by Raphael, but it seems like this fun joke that he's trying to play, this sort of insight that the patron would have. Here I'm now showing you the work called the Disputa, and this stands on the opposite wall from the School of Athens, so it almost looks like Plato and Aristotle are walking towards this image, this Disputa. And this, the name here refers to the disputation between theologians, who are all depicted here, presenting their writings over the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. So this is all about the, the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, that is, when the bread and wine of the Eucharist are blessed, do they actually become the physical body and blood of Christ, or is it a symbolic act? And so you see all of these doctors of the church seated down here below, bishops, lots and lots of bishops, other clerics, and then up at the top, a semicircle of apostles, almost made to look like a church apse, Christ in the center, God the Father up at the top, and then Christ is surrounded by the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist. And as you can probably imagine, this dispute ends with them believing in the true presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Now the standing figure to the right, who is given some prominence here, is actually a portrait of Sixtus IV. Remember, he is the uncle of Julius II. All throughout the room, Raphael does a lot of different things to evoke his patron, Julius II, by using the oak tree, which you can see in the corners here, as well as the emblem of the acorn. And in this work, in the Disputa, you see Julius evoked again in this altar frontal right here, this panel in front of the altar, which contains a double inscription of his name. This is one of the side walls. You could actually see it in the first view of the room that I was showing you. So we've looked at two works so far, School of Athens representing that body of knowledge philosophy, the Disputa, which represents theology, and now we're looking at the wall called the Parnassus, which is referring to poetry. So that's three out of the four major bodies of knowledge that a library would have within it. So Parnassus is the name of a hill, which was said to be the sort of throne of Apollo. And we see Apollo seated right here in the very center at the top of this sort of mountain surrounded by the muses. All around him you see the inclusion of a number of very important poets throughout history. So for example, on the left side here you see Dante in profile. Next to him, shown reaching his hand out and shown blind, is Homer. And then on the other side of Homer, looking back towards Dante, is the Roman poet Virgil. And Virgil is the one who leads Dante through the inferno in the book of the same name. Down here on the left side, this hooded figure is supposed to be Petrarch. And then all the way down here, you have the female poet Sappho, who seems to lean against this door frame. So Raphael's conception of Parnassus as a mountain, which is how it is depicted in mythology, fits perfectly with the working of this room over this window that would always be there. So he's thinking about how he can use the shape of the pictorial space in order to best tell this story. Throughout this room, the poses of the figure and the coloring, the poses of the figures and the coloration that he uses make it seem that Raphael saw the Sistine ceiling. And then finally, Throughout the background of the Parnassus, you see the inclusion of oak trees, again representing the family emblem of Julius II, and essentially he's making Parnassus the Vatican Hill, so saying that Julius brings poetry alive right there. Finally, the fourth wall, which is almost never discussed, is directly across from the Parnassus. This is the wall showing jurisprudence. And jurisprudence is representing the law, so that fourth major body of knowledge. At the very top here, you see a figure of justice seated, and you see her surrounded by images referring to prudence, temperance, and fortitude. And then down at the bottom, you seem to have these two different kinds of court systems. We have the ecclesiastical court, and this is a portrait of Julius II here. And then on the left side, what seems to be a secular court, so showing these two different systems that took place in Rome. And I just wanted to show you a detail of the ceiling for just a minute. Raphael has painted this. This is frescoed, but it's painted to look 
like mosaic. So there's all sorts of interesting things going on in this room referring to the past, and mosaic has some clear associations with the ancient world. Before moving on to the next room, I just want to show you the floor plan of the stanze of Raphael. You can see them here. A, B, C, and D are all rooms that are painted by Raphael or his workshop. So we started by looking at B, the stanza della signatura. This is the first one that Julius II commissions. Following that, Julius commissions him to paint the one called the Stanza di Eliodoro, which is labeled C here. Finally, Leo X, who we'll talk about in a few minutes, commissions him to do A, and finally also D. And in this floor plan, you can also see, you can see how close we are to the Sistine Chapel, labeled here the Capella Sistina. So you can see just how closely Michelangelo and Raphael are working together at the exact same time. So, as I said, Julius II has him paint this room called the Stanza di Eliodoro, the room of Heliodorus, so it's named specifically for the scene I'm showing you here on the left wall, and I will show you that one in detail in a minute. In this room, we see scenes of historical events where there was divine intervention. So here is the expulsion of Heliodorus, the image that the room takes its name from. This theme of divine intervention would have served to underscore the power and legitimacy of the papacy, which was one of Julius's goals in his patronage. We actually see a portrait of Julius II being carried into the scene here, and you can also see that he's carried by and surrounded by figures in contemporary dress in sharp contrast to the garb of the rest of the figures in this scene. What we're seeing here is a story from the Old Testament, and Many figures in this scene are meant to serve as antitypes for Christian figures and contemporary events. So this is further emphasizing the church's view of Christianity as the fulfillment of a new covenant between God and the followers of Christ. So the expulsion of Heliodorus is showing a moment of the protection of the temple's treasury. The royal chancellor Heliodorus, who we see lying over here on the right side, is ordered to confiscate the treasure from the temple of Jerusalem. As he's fleeing with the treasure, a mounted horseman and two other men miraculously appear and beat him to the ground, and we see him drop the treasure, and his attendants with him are also attacked by these miraculous figures. You can see that the two figures here, not on horseback, seem to be hover, hovering over the ground. You can see their shadows cast behind them. Now in the very center of the scene, which is given priority compositionally, you see Onias, the high priest, actually praying for some divine intervention. He prays for the recovery of Heliodorus, and then the apparitions actually reappear, which is not what we're seeing here, heal him, and leads Heliodorus to believe in the sacredness of the temple. Onias in the center has a beard very similar to Julius II, and that is supposed to unify these two figures to see the similarities between the patron and the depicted figure. There are a few strange figures included here which seem to break the decorum of the space, especially these figures climbing up here on the column, which would not have been appropriate in the temple, and also this kneeling woman down below. It's very different than the stately and orderly school of Athens. Here it seems like he's trying to emphasize the skill of the artist in creating interesting poses and quotations of antique sources. So for example, Heliodorus is in the pose of an ancient river god, and the fact that he has this jar spilling out coins is very closely related to how river gods would have jars spilling out water. So again, we see Raphael using perspective and his knowledge of complex architectural structures to create a highly realistic space, which he populates with idealized bodies inspired by classical statuary. So this is rather Michelangelo-esque as well. The expulsion of Heliodorus is charged with motion and energy, very reminiscent of the Sistine ceiling frescoes. So after Julius II dies, Leo X is elected, and he is from the Medici family. In fact, he is the son of Lorenzo de' Medici the Magnificent. He was also a significant patron of the arts. He's the one who sends Michelangelo back to Florence to work on San Lorenzo, but he commissions Raphael to continue his paintings in the Stanze of the Vatican Palace this time specifically in a room called the Stanza del Incendio. And I wanted to show you one image from the Stanza del Incendio, the room, the painting that actually gives the room its name. This is called the Fire in the Borgo, and these commissions start in 1514. Each painting in this room depicts a scene from the life of a previous pope named Leo, since Leo X, he's commemorating all of his previous 
namesakes. In this case, we see a miracle of Leo IV. Leo IV ruled from 847 to 855. In fact, in this painting, we see three simultaneous events taking place. On the left side, you see the fire raging in the Borgo, and that is the name of the neighborhood around the Vatican. We also see a number of people trying to escape here and people trying to put out the fire all the way across the front of the painting and these people pleading for help. And then finally, in the background, this actual moment of the miracle is relegated to the very back. We see Leo IV appearing in a benediction loggia. He has his hand raised and he miraculously puts out the fire simply by raising up his hand. Each element is placed in its own architectural framework. So Raphael is using these classicizing elements of architecture and also actual elements of architecture. So in the background, we see a depiction of old St. Peter's here. He's using that to organize the space. The careful perspective system that he uses hides the fact that there's very little here that makes logical sense. We've got some significant shifts in the scale of figures that make it kind of confusing how the space works. Also, for example, you see this woman over here who is carrying this jug on her head. This is a common figure that's used in several different paintings of the Renaissance, but it doesn't really make sense for you to put a jar of water on your head if you're trying to run to put out a fire. On the left side, you see a gratuitous use of nudity, which is actually much more Michelangelo-esque. And then the man up here hanging on the wall, who's one of the most dramatic figures, is hanging on the wall for absolutely no reason at all. He's right above the ground. Why didn't he just drop? It's very confusing. So there's quite a bit of chaos, and there's some things that don't make a lot of sense. But it's this new style that Raphael is working in later on in his career. Each element here is far more interesting than how it works together as a whole. And it's quite different from the earlier stanze because Raphael has adopted sculptural types as his models. I just wanted to briefly show you some images from the very last room that is executed by the workshop of Raphael. This room is called the Sala di Costantino, the room of Constantine, and these are also commissioned by Leo X, but Raphael dies in the middle of its execution, so for the most part these are worked out by his studio, even though he likely is in charge of the designs. It's an interesting room. It's much larger than the others. It was used as an audience hall. And the frescoes here are made to look like tapestries hanging on the walls. Here you see the donation of Constantine. I won't go into this one very much, but I like showing this image because it gives you a very good sense of what the interior of Old St. Peter's looked like before Bramante's project. One of the other major commissions by Leo X from Raphael was the creation of a series of cartoons, so these full-scale drawings, that were meant to be turned into tapestries. Now these had to be turned into tapestries in Flanders because that's where the best that's where the best tapestry factories were, and these were intended to be hung in the lowest register of the Sistine Chapel. So think back to after Michelangelo paints the ceiling, mostly the chapel is completely decorated. However, for special occasions, Leo X commissions these tapestries to be hung in the lower register of the walls underneath the series of paintings commissioned by Sixtus IV. Now the way that tapestries work, the cartoons are actually designed in reverse because like a print making technique as well, tapestries make these happen in reverse. So if you go to the Vatican museums and see these tapestries, you'll see this one, but it's actually in reverse. So the boatsmen in this boat are actually on the other side and Christ is in fact at the right side. But I prefer to show the cartoons which still survive because they actually show the hand of Raphael. So at this time, under Leo X, many liturgical celebrations are actually happening in the Sistine Chapel because St. Peter's was under construction. In the tapestry cartoons, we see a combination of the classicism employed in the earlier frescoes of the chapel and the nature of the room itself. In this series of cartoons, we have scenes from the Acts of the Apostles, with an emphasis especially on the lives of Peter and Paul and a focus on prayer and preaching, especially on the meditation of the word. And these were always meant to be hung on special occasions. But this subject matter continues what's going on on the walls and the ceiling itself. So the Genesis cycle that Michelangelo paints is the need for the redemption of mankind, which then comes through the life of Moses, the, the old law, and then with the life of Christ, the new law. After Christ's death, 
and partially during his lifetime, as you can see in this image in the miraculous draft of fishes, Christ is still alive. But the apostles, especially Peter and Paul, are the ones who continue his work on earth. The one we're seeing here, the miraculous draft of fishes, is the story of Christ telling the empty-handed fishermen to cast their nets on the other side of the boat for a successful catch. You see a lot of interesting classicism going on here, especially with the boatman over here. He's reclining very much like Heliodorus was, just like a river god. And then you have these very muscular fishermen who are reaching over to pick up these very heavy nets. And these were called the nudes of Michelangelo's Sistine ceiling. At the same time, even though these seem to be quotations and looking to ancient statuary, it's all very naturalistic. These are rather big, hulking figures for Raphael, but it would be really suitable in the Sistine Chapel. You've got these really beautiful reflections on the waters, which are also echoed in the tapestries themselves. So you've got a lot of dramatic realism incorporated here. Interestingly, the cartoons of the tapestries stayed in Flanders, and many other tapestries were actually made from them. Later patrons would learn from this and demand the return of the cartoons with the finished product. Tapestries were very, very expensive to produce and were very luxurious. So in Leo's method of putting his stamp on the Sistine Chapel, it was one of the most costly, as these were woven with silver and golden threads into silk backgrounds. So Leo is establishing a comparison with, of himself with Julius and setting up a comparison between Raphael and Michelangelo as well. Leo X didn't just commission sacred works from Raphael. He was a rather decadent pope, and he wanted to decorate part of the papal palaces as well that wasn't used for official business, so a more private part of the palace, especially in the residential area of the popes, and this part of the palace is closed off today. Nobody can go visit it, unfortunately. So I need to go back a little bit in time just to set up what we're looking at here. Back to the later 15th century, we've been looking at artists who are classicizing according to the taste of the time, who are drawing from and incorporating ancient sculptures into their paintings. That's largely because not a lot of Roman painting was known at the time. But in the 1480s, the remains of the Domus Aurea, the Golden House of Nero, were discovered in the late 15th century when a young man fell into the hillside just up above where the Colosseum is today. This Golden House of Nero was enormous, and most of it had been covered up by other monuments from later emperors, most notably the Colosseum. While, while the Colosseum was being built, the Domus Aurea was mostly filled in with dirt. Although it had largely been stripped of its decoration and its marble during the reign of the later emperors, the walls were still covered in paint. So when this was rediscovered, artists began to go inside and draw from the remains on the wall. These sort of motifs, and we see them echoed in the decoration here, especially on the architecture of the rooms, these are referred to as grotesques and they begin to appear in wall paintings regularly after this discovery. Vasari even tells us that Raphael goes and drew from the remains himself in 1515. So what I'm showing you here is referred to as the loggia of Pope Leo X, and a loggia is an open-air covered walkway on the side of a building, so it's a, it's a sort of hybrid indoor and outdoor space. These have been glazed since, but originally this was open air. The side walls of the loggia opposite the open arches are done in a completely all antica style, so after the antique. And these are done almost certainly by a man named Giovanni da Udine, who was a stucco expert and in the workshop of Raphael. And so on the sides, we're seeing these stucco reliefs that are imitations of gems and cameos, as well as some frescoed grotesques. We have garlands, columns, cherubs, animals, and occasional narrative scenes interspersed as well. These are painted directly onto the wall, but made to look like a picture gallery. So you can see these sort of framing device for these other windows here that make it look like framed images. Leo X Loggia is creating a corridor, a corridor as if it were an ancient Roman palace. What we're seeing here is a merging of antiquarianism, so a collecting of ancient objects, and the classical style, so that we're seeing collectors and patrons trying to emulate ancient Romans. Raphael isn't the first one to work like this. 
There's some similar examples in the late 15th century, but here we have the first work completely done in grotesque, rather than them just serving as decoration. There's no spatial recession, there's no attempt at creating three-dimensional space in this, it's all surface. It's very appropriate for a Medici Pope, especially one whose father was Lorenzo the Magnificent. It's like the Medici collection of gems was put on the walls here. Now I want to show you one example of the frescoed ceiling, but what's really interesting about this series of scenes, so you've got all of these different barrel vaults that are then covered in frescoes, one in each bay here, and you see the hands of lots of different artists in Raphael's workshop. So for the most part, Raphael's role here is not as the primary painter, it's not as the stuccoist, instead he is the manager of a whole troop of artists. In each vault, we have a clear use of a different artist in the narrative scenes. Most of them were probably done by a very famous painter and architect named Giulio Romano. Throughout, we have Old Testament stories and then scenes from the life of Christ done in what's called quadro riportato, which is illusionistically hung and framed by architecture with stucco angels in the center, each holding an emblem of Leo X. So here, for example, it shows you a really good example of the illusionism taking place here. So we see a couple of different types of illusionism, actually. First, this quadro riportato that I talked about. These are, paint these are paintings that are made to look like they're on any wall, but have been transported to the ceiling. And then in the background with this scene in particular, you have what's called quadratura, which is an illusionistic extension of the architecture of the room. And then here you can see in the very center that stucco angel that's holding an emblem of the patron. So in this bay, we're seeing scenes from the life of King David. And as I said, it seems that an individual painter was given all four narratives in one bay so that there's some stylistic unity in each individual bay, but it changes from bay to bay, and this almost seems to be something that's prized by the patron. It gives variety and shows a change in what was acceptable in commissions. Earlier Renaissance contracts demanded that everything be done by the hand of the studio master, but that becomes less and less important. It actually enhances the impression of richness. So Raphael probably prepared the designs and drawings and left the execution of them up to his assistant. He was an extremely busy artist. He had so many projects going on at one time. He was the commissioner of antiquities. He was an architect. He wouldn't have been able to get it all done without his studio. Now, Raphael doesn't just work for the Pope, though, while he's in Rome. He also executes two very important commissions for a Sienese banker named Augustino Chigi, who was an entrepreneur and, as I said, a banker who becomes the banker to the Pope. He actually becomes, during his lifetime, the most wealthy man in Europe. He builds a palace for himself or a sort of suburban villa in an undeveloped area of Rome. And a villa is a sort of pleasure palace where you could go for the day. I mean, this has sleeping areas too, but it's mostly to have dinner parties. It's a place to keep your mistress. It's a place to hear pagan music, to have pagan paintings away from your more official residence. Raphael paints in a couple of different rooms in this villa, now referred to as the Farnesina, although originally it would have been named for Augustino Chigi as the Villa Chigi. For this ground floor loggia, Augustino Chigi hires Raphael in a studio to paint an illusionistic arbor with garlands wrapping around two narrative scenes of the marriage of Cupid and Psyche, so mythological figures, and then the other narrative scene shows Psyche being received on Mount Olympus. And the intention here, hopefully you can see that in this detail, is that it's supposed to look like tapestries strung up in this arbor overhead. As I said, this is one of the entrance loggias. This is actually the major entrance to the villa facing the private gardens, and this is a sort of transitional space between the gardens and the living areas. So up above you see these garlands incorporating all sorts of fruits and vegetables, many of which were plants that came from the New World rather than Europe. And actually many of these fruits and vegetables are very erotic, they're very sexually charged, very phallic, and some of them are very vaginal as well. So through the garland you can see the sky beyond birds flying above, and then he also fills most of these spaces with various depictions of gods and goddesses. Here I'm showing you not a very good image, unfortunately, but one of the narrative scenes that's depicted here, and this one 
is the marriage of Cupid and Psyche or the banquet of Cupid and Psyche. We see many suggestive poses taking place here at this lavish banquet, very much like what would have taken place at this villa. So Augustino Kiji was very famous for his lavish dinner parties where he would serve his guests the finest fare, including such things as the tongues of parrots, so very exotic food. And he was also famous for after a dinner party was over, this villa was right on the river Tiber that runs right through Rome, and he would throw all of the gold and silver plate into the river to show just how wealthy he was. But this was totally an illusion because then after everybody left, his servants would go and pick up the nets that caught all of the dinnerware so that he wasn't actually wasting the money. So this sort of scene is quite appropriate for the setting, as the illusionistic arbor was also a subject in ancient Roman paintings, and the idea of a suburban villa is also an emulation of ancient Roman practices. You can see a harmonious composition, a balanced design, and lots of classical forms, and of course the subject matter is classicizing these mythological figures. But you might notice here that the style, the manner in which Raphael and his studio is working is quite different than what he's doing in the stanze for Julius II and Leo X. This was also a studio piece, so his students probably executed most of the work. Raphael was very careful to plan for his audience in the style, but also in the subject matter. Now this is not the most appropriate work or subject matter for such intimates of the Pope, but this license and duality was accepted at this point in time before the church really starts being concerned with reform. So a wealthy and illustrious patron would demand good illusionism, classical learning, and erotic pleasure. Raphael also works in another adjacent room to that loggia, and this is actually done a little bit earlier. This is in the Sala di Galatea, and this is Raphael's painting of that figure, Galatea, so it's named for this painting by Raphael. This is another mythological theme, this time based on a poem by Angelo Poliziano, who I talked about as well when we were discussing Botticelli's mythological scenes. Galatea was a sea nymph who scorned the Cyclops Polyphemus, and actually I'm not showing it to you here, but the adjacent painting is a depiction of Polyphemus, so it's like she looks back towards him. And in that adjacent scene, he's shown singing her a love song. Galatea is shown riding away in her sea chariot, accompanied by nymphs and other sea creatures. There are dolphins included here. Renaissance dolphins are so funny. They look like these fearsome beasts. And they're symbols of Venus as well, and thus of love. So you can see her holding the reins of her dolphins who are carrying her away in this shell boat. You see this very interesting balance of poise and activities. And this fresco is one of the most important moments of this classicizing style. Although it does lack some naturalism, these sort of sea horses that you see in the background here, look how their hooves seem to rest right on the surface of the water. Nothing seems to really come in or out of the water. It's lacking some illusionism. It's this beautiful, beautiful painting. The figures are done very naturalistically. It's very classicizing, but it's not quite as naturalistic as some of his later works, especially those that he's doing in the Vatican. So Raphael actually dies quite young in the year 1520. He was only 37 years old. He was probably the most sought after painter in Rome and had an exceptionally successful studio, as I talked about. And he worked for private patrons nearly as often as he did for popes and cardinals. Eventually, many of his assistants become his successors, especially Giulio Romano, who I mentioned before. Leo X commissions Romano to continue Raphael's commissions on his death and even adds new work to his load. So I want to end today's lecture with Raphael's final painting. This is commissioned by Cardinal Giulio de' Medici, who later becomes Pope Clement VII, the second Medici Pope. This was commissioned by Raphael for an, for an altar in Narbonne Cathedral, a French cathedral, where Giulio de' Medici was actually the bishop. However, Raphael died when this wasn't quite finished. This is probably finished by his workshop, and it was so celebrated at his death that Giulio de' Medici decided it could not possibly be sent to France and instead was put up in a church in Rome, actually where Bramante's Tempietto stands. The story of the Transfiguration comes from the New Testament where Christ goes up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John who are shown down here below him, and they see 
him in this moment of resplendence where he rises, levitates above them, is shown in this heavenly light. And they also see in this vision Moses and Elijah surrounding him on either side. And they hear the voice of God showing Christ as his son. Now, this was a fairly common subject, not ex extremely common, but, you know, a very typical representation. But Raphael does something completely new here. He includes a narrative scene at the bottom of the panel here. We see the transfiguration at the top and then the disciples down here at the bottom. Raphael, for these two different areas, is creating two completely separate scenes, yes, in the narrative, but also the color system and the drawing, the, the, the representation of the figures is very different to each scene as well. So in the top, you have this more ethereal scene. The figures are a little softer, whereas down below, you have these much bolder, darker colors and a much more sculptural Michelangelo-esque style. So at the bottom, what we're seeing here is this attempted healing of a possessed boy. So you see this figure, this youth here, who's got to be the most muscular 12-year-old who's ever existed. He's brought to the disciples by all of these townspeople, the family members, and all of the disciples are reacting very dramatically. They're all in different gestures, and several of them are pointing up to the mountain saying, no, 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 you're going to have to wait for this guy up here and the other disciples who are known for their healing. There's nothing that we can do about this here. And so there's this very dramatic intensity taking place at the bottom and this sort of stillness and majestic quality at the very top. So Raphael's very last painting becomes the most famous painting in Rome after his death, and it was held as the pinnacle of art for centuries to come. So for example, when Napoleon invades Italy, he has this entire list of works that he wants to take back to the Louvre to form the new French collection. In Rome, the Transfiguration is the top of his list. So it becomes very, very important and holds sway over artists for many generations to come. After the death of Raphael, many people consider that the end of the High Renaissance, and some art historians have characterized it as a decline in art shortly thereafter. That's not something we really would talk about today. It's just a different style takes hold after the death of Raphael. So his career was very quick and very important, working from devotional images early in his career in Florence to major monumental altarpieces like this one. This painting is probably eight or nine feet high and becomes the most celebrated painter, even more so than Michelangelo. Raphael had better relationships with patrons. He was more liked. The popes liked him so much. In fact, Leo X wanted to make him a cardinal. He was a perfect courtier. He knew the perfect behavior for a court artist, and he was rewarded for it significantly. So I hope you can see the changes in his style, his ability to assimilate other artistic developments, especially through people he's working with, and especially with Michelangelo. And I hope you can see his synthesis of both the importance of color and of good drawing. So thank you for watching, and I will see you for Module 7.